Hi, I'm Philip Hickman. Welcome to the Shakespeare Underground. I am the artistic director here at Actors Theatre of Columbus. As you know, we have been filming a series of staged readings of Shakespeare's Apocrypha, that is to say plays that Shakespeare may have written part of or have been attributed to him uh, over the course of history. Tonight's play is a comedy from 1592 called A Knack to Know a Knave. Now, this show has had a lot of different attributions over the years. More recently, people are giving it some credit for being uh, at least partially written by Shakespeare. It was mostly known for its primary performers, who were Edward Allen and William Kemp. So we hope you enjoy the show. Um, it is really funny. Of course, Actors Theater would like to thank the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, the Columbus Foundation, and the Rheinberger Foundation for their support of us. We would also like to thank Regina Acosta Tobin with Metro Village Realty and Viewtech Rough HER Realtors for their support of the Shakespeare Underground. Of course, if you want to support what we're doing, if you want to stay in contact with our various performances and readings, you can do that at our website, uh, theactorstheater.org, and you can find a link below uh, with that information. So that's all for now, although I do want to give you an update that we are changing our schedule. We are no longer be going to be doing uh, weekly readings for the Shakespeare Underground. We're going to be moving to once a month, first Mondays, like the Shakespeare Underground has been since we began. So we hope you enjoy the show. Have a good evening. Dunstan, how highly are we bound to praise the eternal God that still provides for us and gives us leave to rule in this our land. First, murder we reward with present death. And those that do commit felonious crimes, our laws of England, do award them death. And he that doth despoil a virgin's chastity must likewise suffer death by law's decree. And that decree is irrevocable. Then as I am God's vice generant here on earth, by God's appointment here to reign and rule, so must I seek to cut abuses down that like to Hydra's heads daily grows up, one in another's place, and therein makes the land infectious. Your grace's care herein I must commend, and England hath such cause to praise the Lord that sent so good a king to govern. Uh, your life may be a lantern to the state, a perfect <sighs> sign of humility. Uh, myself, dread prince, in token of my love uh, and dutiful obedience to your grace, will study daily, as my duty wills, to root sins from the flourishing commonwealth that fame in every angle of the world may sound due praise on England's virtuous king. I tell thee, Dunstan, thou hast pleased the king and proved thyself a virtuous counselor. Thy counsel is to me as... North Star Light, that guides the sailor to his wished port, for by that star he is so comforted that he sails dangerless on dangerous seas, and in his deepest sadness comforts him. So Dunstan's knowledge is that star of joy that will with help conduct me to my happiness. And yet thou art not happy, Edgar, because that sins like swarms remain in thee. What? Well, why? Tis impossible, for I have studied still to root abuses from the commonwealth that may infect the king or commonality. Therefore, base peasant willful as thou art, I tell thee, troth, thou hast displeased the king. Nay, the king hath displeased himself in trusting everyone that speaks him fair. For though fair words, kings many times are fain to countenance knaves by their authority. I will not say your grace doth so. No, sir, you were not best. Why, if I should, I might make good my word and find a knave, I fear, before I part. Well, why, what art thou? Mary, I go plain, and my name is Honesty. A friend to your grace, but a foe to flatterers. And one that hath a knack to know a knave. As how, sir? By art or by some foolish gift God hath given you? Oh. 
are you are some physician or skilled physiognomy, physiognomy or palmistry? For I am sure you can never do it by astronomy, because there are no stars to know a knave. True, but many an honest man knows a knave to his cost, and is neither physician or skilled physiognomer, palmster, nor astronomer, but a plain man of the country, like me, that knows a knave if he do, but see his cap. <sighs> that were pretty, I think, to see. Honest to know a knave by his cap. <laughs> Tis more than I can do with all the skill I have. Uh, but tell me, I pray thee, how I should know a knave? I believe you well, for offenders never bury their offenses till the law find them and punish them. But you would fain tell how to know a knave. Then thus, the first man you meet in the morning, if he salute you, draw near him and smell to his hat as he smell to your own, and my cap to a noble, if his smells like yours, he is a knave. I believe I spoke to you just now. <laughs> villain. Were it not the king's presence, I'll privilege thy presumption. I would teach you to jest with your fellows. Forbear honesty. Thou art a good plain fellow, and I commend thy wit that has such ways to know a knave. <laughs> Honesty is plain, my lord, but no good fellow. For good fellows be purse takers nowadays, and there be so many of good fellows that honesty may walk the streets without company. Not that there wants company, but honest company, I mean. Yet honesty can clap a knave on the shoulder for all his bravery. Why, base villain, mean you me? Not base, sir, because I was truly begotten. For honesty may be suspected, but never detected. But you think I had a bailiff to my father, as you had, and that my mother could return a writ of error, as yours did, when such a gallant as you were gotten. Believe me, Perrin, she hath touched you now, and I perceive, though honesty be simple, yet many times she speaks the truth. <laughs> True, if it please your grace, for honest men will not lie. But if your grace vouchsafe to give me leave, you shall see me find more knaves than one. If my cunning fail me not, else say honesty had no honesty. Uh, but tell me, Dunstan, how thinkest thou of this motion? Were it not good, thinkest thou, we gave her leave to stifle such caterpillars as corrupt the commonwealth? Then tell me, Dunstan, what thinkest thou of her motion? Oh, that whatsoever the king himself thought me, uh, he would in dutiful obedience yield on to. Uh, and so saith Dunstan to your majesty. For many times such simple men bring that to pass that wiser heads cannot attain on to. For doubtless he has some device in hand whereby to find such a subtle knavery. Well, Dunstan, then, as thou hast counseled me, I will for once make proof of honesty. Sirrah, come hither. In hope you will, as your profession is in honest sort to find deceivers out, and finding them out to give us notice straight, that we may punish them for their amiss. We give thee leave to work what means thou mayst, so it be not prejudice to the state, nor to us. My gracious lord, if honesty offend in anything she hath promised, and do not, as your grace has given in charge, stifle such caterpillars that corrupt the state, let honesty receive such punishment as deserve those that leases to the king. But now I will to my task and leave your grace. Honesty, farewell. Look unto your charge. <clears throat> my gracious lord, <laughs> if I might not offend, I would entreat a favor at your hand. Tis so I heard of late, my gracious lord, that my kind father lay at the point of death. And if, my lord, I should not visit him, the world, I fear, would find great fault in me. Nay, Perrin, if your business be of weight, we are content to give you leave to go, provided this, that you return again when you have seen your father and your friends. My gracious lord, I will not stay there long. Only but see my father and return again. Till when, my gracious lord, I take my leave. Perrin, farewell. And tell me, Dunstan, now we are alone, what dost thou think of beauteous Elfrida? 
for she is reported to be passing fair. They say she hath a white pit in her chin that makes her look like the queen of love. <laughs> oh, believe me, Dunstan, if she be so fair, she will serve our turn to make a concubine. Methinks tis good some time to have a love to sport with all and pass away the time. Ay, uh, my good lord, uh, Dunstan could well allow of it, if your grace would marry Alfreda. What? Wouldst thou have me marry her I never saw? Then men would say I doted on a wench. But Dunstan, I have found a policy which must indeed be followed to the full. Earl Ethan Vol, welcome. I thought to send for you. You must go, do a message for us now. Tis nothing but to woo a wench, which you can do. You must not woo her for yourself, but uh, for me. Tell her I sit and pine like Tantalus, and if you can, strain forth a, a tear for me. Tell her she shall be honored in my love and bear a child that one day may be king. Bid her not to stand on terms, but uh, send me word whether she be resolved to love me, yea or no. If she say no, tell her I can enforce her love. Or tis no matter though, you leave that out and tell her this. We hear she is a wise, uh, as wise as eloquent and full of oratory. For, for some report, women love to be praised. Then in my cause, I pray thee, love thou Elfrida. I will, my lord, woo her in your behalf. Plead love for you and strain a sigh to show your passions. Say she is fairer than the dolphin's eye. In maze the night stars stand and gaze. And then I will praise her chin and cheek and pretty hand. Mm -hmm. These words, mm -hmm. my lord, I will, will make her love, I am sure. And if these will not, my lord, I have far better. Oh, nay, this is well. Now, Ethanvald, be gone, for I shall long to hear of thy return. My gracious lord, I humbly take my leave. Ethanwald, farewell. Dunstan, how likest thou this? What, have I done well in sending Ethanwald? But in good time, how if he like the maid? Uh, believe me, Dunstan, then my game is marred. I, I do not think, my gracious lord, my nephew Ethanwald bears that pat mine. Uh, hitherto he hath been termed just, uh, and clept your grace his gracious favor. True, Dunstan. Uh, yet have I read that love hath made the son deceive the father oft. Uh, but, Dunstan, leaving this, come, let's to court. I will attend upon your majesty. My sons? Uh, you s uh, My sons? You see how age decays my state. Uh, yet ere I yield myself to death, my sons, uh, give ear, and hear what rules I set you down. Uh, and first, uh, to thee, my son, that livest by wit, I, I know thou hast so many honest slights to shift and cozen smoothly on thy wit, uh, to cog and lie and brave it with the best. That twere but labor lost to counsel thee. <laughs> <coughs> And therefore to the next, Walter, uh, that seems in show a husbandsman. My son, when that, they mas when that thy master thrusts thee most and thinks thou dealest as truly as himself, be thou the first to work to seek to him. So by that means thou mayst enrich thyself. Uh, by now, my son, thou keeps the court. Oh, be thou the means to set the peers at strife and curry favor for the common's love, if any but in the conference name the king. Inform his majesty, they envy him. And if the king but move or speak to thee, kneel on both knees and say, God save your majesty. Uh, but who is next? Uh, that am I, father, that use the word of God and live only by the heavenly means. Oh. Uh, the priest? Uh, g give ear, my son. I have a lesson yet in store for thee. <laughs> thou must, my son, make show of holiness and blind the world with thy hypocrisy. And sometime give a penny to the poor, uh, but let it be uh, in the church or the marketplace that men may praise thy liberality. But warn thou the world from sin and vile excess 
and now and then speak against drunkenness. So by this means thou shalt be termed wise, and with thy pureness blind the people's eyes. <laughs> but now, my sons, discourse to me in brief how you have lived and how you mean to die. Hmm. Then, uh, father, thus I live to use my wit. Unto myself I live to be wise. For when I am driven to shift for meat or corn or gay apparel to maintain me brave, then do I flaunt it about the change. And if I were some landed gentleman and falling in with some rich merchant there, I take commodities for six months' stay. The bill being made, I must set to my hand. Then if I pay not, they may burn the band. <laughs> then, Father, hark how I have profited. Walter, your son that keeps the country, I, I have raised the markets and oppressed the poor and made a thousand go from door to door. And why did I, thank you, use this extremity? because I would have corn enough to feed the enemy. Uh, Father, you know we have but a while to live, and he that lives must still increase his store, for he that hath most wealth of all desireth more. Father, I use my wits to flatter with the king. If any in private conference name the king, I straight inform his grace they envy him. Thus with the king I curry favor still, though with my heart I wish him any ill. And sometimes I can counterfeit his hand and seal and borrow money from the commonality. And thus I live and flaunted with the best and none dare speaks against me in the court because they know that the king doth favor me. I, among my brethren and friends, uh, do still instruct them with my doctrine and yea and nay goes through the world with us. By not an oath we swear for 20 pounds. Brethren say we take heed by Adam's fall for by his sins we are condemned at all. Thus preach we unto our brethren, though in our hearts we never mean anything. Thus do we blind the world with holiness. All well and wisely have you said, my son, and I commend you for your favored forward minds, that in your lives beray whose sons ye are. Here have I been a bail of three score years, and used exaction on the dwellers by. I took a bribe and set the prisoners free. So by such dealings, I have got the wealth, which I would have dispersed among you all with this proviso, that you shall all live and lead such lives as I have set you down. Live to yourselves while you have time to live. Get what you can, but see ye nothing give. Oh, oh, but hark, my sons, methinks I hear a noise. Ah, see, my sons, where death, pale death appears to summon me before a fearful judge. So be thou safe, and body fly to hell. Brother, why do you not read to my father? Truly, my book of exhortation is uh, at my place of exercise. Without it, I, I can do nothing. I, God's peace be with him. Tis strange to see how men of honesty are troubled many times with subtle knavery, for they have so many cloaks to color their abuses that honesty may well suspect them, but never detect them. For if she should, they have by their knavery got so many friends that though never so bad, they will stand in defense with the best. I was at the waterside where I saw such deceit, I dare not say knavery, in paying and receiving custom for outlandish wares that I wondered to see, yet durst not complain of. The reason was they were countenanced with men of great wealth, richer than I a great deal, but not honester. Then I went into the markets where I saw petty knavery in false measuring corn and in scales that wanted no less than two ounces in the pound. But this was all nothing, scant worth the talking of. But when I came to the exchange, I espied in a corner of an aisle an arc cousiner, a pony catcher, I mean, 
which used such gross cousining as you would wonder to hear. Oh, but here he comes, fine and brave. Honesty, mark him down for a knave. Why, Cuthbert, wilt thou never leave thou old knavery? What we should greet together like bells if thou wert but hanged first. <laughs> Why, man, we are but birds of a feather, and whosoever says nay, we will hold together. Come, you mad slave, dost thou not know me? Tush, I have done many better tricks than this. Why, you base slave, take you me for your fellow? <laughs> Why, I am of a of good reputation in the city, and held in account with the best. And yet you are Cuthbert the Cunny Catcher. The bailiff's son of Hexham, whose father, being dead, the, the devil hath carried to hell for his knavery. How sayest thou, thou art not his son? This grave black cloak makes you so proud, you have forgotten who was your father. Nay, <laughs> I have not forgotten that my father was a bailiff, a man that would live to himself, and yet in faith he gave me nothing at his death but good counsel how to live in the world. But, Sirrah, as thou knowest me, I pray thee, pray me not, as anything I can, commend me. Hush! Fear not me, I will be as secret as thyself. But, Sirrah, tis thus, if thou wilt do one thing, I shall tell thee, I will give thee one hundred pound. Tis nothing with thee, I am sure. <laughs> tell me what it is, I'll do it, I warrant thee. No, oh, nothing but this, to swear upon a book that thou sawest a gentleman pay a farmer 400 pound as the last payment of a farm that the said gentleman bought of him. If this be all, let me alone, I will do it. Why, it is nothing for me to swear, for I am forsworn already. But when is the day? Why, tomorrow. But where shall I meet you? Why, upon the exchange at eight o'clock. I will not miss it. Till that time. Farewell. Farewell? Nay, you will scant farewell by the time that I have done, but I must about my business to find some knack to know this knave at large. Night draws on. Black, dusty clouds environ round the globe. Heaven is covered with a sable robe. Now am I come to the king to do the king's command for to wench and win her for the king. If I like her well, well I say no more. The good to have a hat before the door. Uh, but first I will move her father to prefer the earnest suit I have in canvassing, so I may see the maid who wed I in bed her too. But who is there? What ho? Earl Ethanwald, welcome. How fares our friends at court? What causes constrain your honor that thus late you visit us that dream not of your coming? My lord, I am come unlooked for. Very true, so is my coming yet concealed from you. Your honor shall repose you here tonight, and early as you please begin your task. Time serves not now. Come, Ethanwald, as welcome as the king himself to me. Now, Ethanwald, of fortune favor thee, thou mayst prove a happy love to Alfreda. This is the place and the appointed time. I know he'll keep his word, for he thinks me his friend. No, oh, but tell me, honesty, am I not well disguised, huh? It's me. Can any man discern me by my looks to be the king? Take heed of that, for then our game is marred, and hast thou promised him what reward he shall have? Hush, fear you not, for you never knew honest man dissemble with his friend, though many friends dissemble with honest men. But, my lord, the cards be shuffled, and here comes a knave. <laughs> this is the honest man I told you of, one that will do your pleasure in the cause, so be it you content him for his pains. Else God forbid, and good sir, thus it is I bought a farm of one that dwells hereby, and for an earnest gave an hundred pound, the rest was to be paid as six weeks past. Now, sir, 
I would have you as witness that at my house you saw me pay 300 pound, and for your pains I will give you an hundred pound. Besides, I will stand your friend in what I may. You hear the cause. What will your conscience serve you to do it? How say you, sir, my conscience? <laughs> then you touch me. I tell you, sir, my conscience will serve me to do more than this. Why, I have sworn against mine own father for money. I have sworn, right or wrong, anyways, for money. When I have received money before witness, I swore to the contrary. And, to, and do you misdoubt me in so slight a matter as this, when I have sworn against father, mother, and all my kin? Ha! <laughs> I told you, sir, how resolute you should find him. He doth do it without fear, I warrant you. I think that in London you could not have found a man so fit for your purpose. I knew his father, sir, a man of honest reputation and one whose life was witness to the life he led. He was a bailiff, sir. No, I say it, but no bailiff that used deceit. He had too good a conscience for that. All the better for that, for it should seem by his behavior that he hath had good upbringing. Indeed. My father in his lifetime was a man given to the fear of God and to use much devotion. Aye, but he gave nothing for God's sake, except it were hard words or blows, and they had been better kept than given. But hush, here comes the judge. Hear you, sir. If you be in readiness, here is the judge. Aye, sir, I fear not. I warn you. <clears throat> is that your adversary? <laughs> what an old crust it is. I think the villain hath a face hardened with steel. He could never be so impudent else. <laughs> if it please your worship, this man that wrongfully would have my farm from me facing me down that he hath paid me that which he never offered, nor have I never received. And this day he hath promised to make proof that he hath paid me full 400 pound. And so I can, and here's my witness to it, that saw me when I paid the money. Why, I am sure he will not say it. I never saw the man in my life. No, sir. But I saw you, and was a witness when this gentleman paid you 300 pound as the last payment for the farm he bought. But where was the money tendered? At the gentleman's house. You see, Father, this merchant will be witness that he saw so much money tendered, and you received it, being full satisfied as the last payment for the farm he bought. And if this merchant take his oath against you, that seven days past he saw the money tendered, I must pass sentence, then against you needs. But will you swear on the Bible this is true? Aye, sir, and to that intent I came hither, for I will never refuse to swear a truth while I live. <laughs> well, if thou be well advised, take thy oath. But yet remember before whom you swearest against the God of truth and perfect equity, the God of truth that will revenge wrong to the innocent with thousand plagues and torture worse than death. Yes, yes, by the holy contents of this Bible and by that just God before whom I stand, Peace, I so shameless villain, I did in any Inextricable wretch, monster of nature, degenerate miscreant who ever, ever heard so vile an oath. Have I such monstrous vipers in my land that with their very breaths infect the air? Say, Dunstan, hast thou ever heard the like? Oh, my liege, such loathsome weeds must needs infect the corn. Such cankers perish both the root and branch, unless they soon be spied and weeded out. I'll be the husbandman to most such tares. Here, honesty, let him be manacled and scar his forehead that he may be known as Cain for murder, he for perjury. Well, I beseech your grace, be good to me. Oh, good villain. There's no help for you. The king commands me on his embassage to 
Osric's daughter, beauteous Alfreda, the height and pride of all this sounding ill, most amain, plead love in his behalf, the court for him, and woo and wed the maid. Have you never heard that theme? Our deceit is in love is but a merriment to such as seek a rival to prevent whither distraught roams my unruly thoughts. Is it, it is the king I cousin of his choice, he nil brook Earl Ethan Walt to prove false to be his prince, especially in love. Then thus it shall be if I tell or I'll tell the king the maid is fair, no worthy companion for an earl or so but not fit a bride for Edgar, England's king. This will allay the strong effects in love, fame wrought in Edgar's mind for Elfrida. But I'll go to court to dally with the king and work some means to draw his mind from love. Neighbor Walter, I cannot but admire to see how housekeeping has decayed within this 30 year. But where the fault is, God knows I know not. My father in his lifetime gave hospitality to all strangers and distressed travelers. His table was never empty of bread, beef, and beer. He was wont to keep a hundred tall men in his hall. He was a feaster of all comers in general. And yet was he never in want of money. I think God did bless him with increase for his bountiful mind. Truly, sir, I am sorry you are fallen into decay and that you want to maintain a household charge. And whereof comes this one? I will tell you, sir, tis only through your great housekeeping. Be ruled by me and do as I advise you. Keep but a boy or two within your house to run of errands and to wait on you. And for your kitchen, uh, keep a woman cook, uh, one that will serve for 30 shilling a year. And by that means you save two liveries. Your drink too strong and taste too much of malt, but tough single beer is better far, both for your profit and your servant's health. And at Christmas time, feast none at all, but such as yield you some commodity. I mean, such as will send you now and then fat geese and capons to keep your house withal. To these and none else would I have you liberal. Why, neighbor, my goods are lent me to no other end but to relieve my needy brethren. But God, I hope, hath in store for me. I trust you to that, and you may help hap die a beggar. Tis better for a man to trust to himself now and then. Let God provide for the poor. I tell you, neighbor, my great-grandfather and all my predecessors have been held in good regard for their good housekeeping. And God willing, their good name shall never take an exeunt in me. For I will, God willing, keep such hospitality to my death as my state can maintain, and I will rather sell my land to maintain housekeeping than keeping my land make sale of my good name for housekeeping. But stay, who comes here? God save you, gentlemen. The king greets you, and at this time have some occasion to use money, hence since you know what that you that be knights and squires lend his grace. And you, master farmer, be brief, sirs, I cannot say. Sir, though housekeeping be some hindrance to my willing mind, by reason that it robs me of that which should bewray my loving mind both to my prince and country, money, I mean, which at this time I stand in some want of, yet of that small store that I have, I am willing to impart the lending of the king twenty pound, and more, I assure you, I am not able. Mm, very well. But what saith the farmer? Can he spare for the king? Uh, Mary, sir, I, I am a poor farmer, and, and yet I can afford to lend the king a hundred or, or two of pounds. And hear you, sir, if you prefer a suit I have to the king, I will give you forty angels for your pains. Hmm, why, that's well said, and I commend thy honest mind. Why, would men of all thy mind, I warn thee, thou art an honest man, and one that loves the king. But tell me, what wouldst thou have me do? Nothing uh, but procure me the king's letter to convey corn beyond the seas. For in England it is so good cheap that a man can make no living by selling thereof. Therefore, if the king will grant me his letter, I will at any time lend him five or, or six hundred pound, and perhaps never ask it again, and I will not forget your pains. <laughs> Sir, fear not, I will do it for you, I warrant you. For I tell you, I can do much with the king. I believe you will do much more than you will be commended for. 
the courtier resembleth the jay that decketh himself with the feathers of other birds to make himself glorious. So the courtier must be brave, though he be hanged at the gallows. Well, sir, will it please you to come and dine with me? I thank you, sir, heartily. Uh, but what's she there in your company? A plain lady. Her name is Honesty. Well, let her go where she will, for she shall not dine with me. <laughs> See how the farmer fears my name. What would he do if he knew my nature? But hear you, Master Courtier, shall I dine with you? I promise, sir, I am very hungry. Truly, Honesty, if I were furnished with money, I would not stick to give thee thy dinner. But now, thou seest, I am but a guest myself. Truly, Honest Lady, if I were certain of my cheer, I would bid thee to dinner. But no, not my provision, not I promise thee. Hear you, sir. Will it please you to take part of a piece of beef with me? You shall be welcome. I thank you, sir, but I must dine with my honest friend here, else I would not refuse your gentle offer. Oh, see how he can use my name and not me. But I perceive I may go dine with Duke Humphrey. God be wait, gentlemen, for none here hath occasion to use honesty. Yes, honesty, thou shalt be my brother's guest and mine. Mary, and I thank you, too, for now, today, the world may say that honesty dines with hospitality. Daughter, see that you entertain the Earl as best beseems his state in thy degree. He comes to see whether fame have worthily been stingy in commending thee or no. So shall thy virtues be admired at the court, and thou be praised for kind and debonair, for courtesy contents a courier oft, when nothing else seems pleasant in his eyes. Father, you shall perceive that Elfrida will do her best in honoring of your age to entertain the Earl of Cornwall so, that he shall think him highly favored through loving speech and courteous entertain. <clears throat> How fares is my Lord of Cornwall? What, displeased or, or troubled with a mood that's malcontent? Uh, not malcontent, and yet I am not well. Uh, for I'm troubled with a painful room, that when I would be merry troubles me, and I'm going to hold it in my eyes uh, with such extremes that I can, I can scarcely see. How long have you been troubled with the pain? Or is it a pain that you have usual? Or is it some water that by taking cold is fallen into your eyes and troubles you? Uh, I cannot tell, but sure it pains me much. Uh, nor did it trouble me till now, for till I came to lodge within your house. Uh, my eyes were clear and I never felt the pain. I am sorry that my house should cause your grief. Daughter, if you have any skill at all, I pray you, use your cunning with the Earl and see if you can ease him of his pain. I will, if it so please the Earl to accept it, endeavor what I may to comfort him. My Lord, I have waters of approved worth and such as are not common to be found, any of which, if it please your honor, use them. I am in hope uh, will help you to your sight. Oh, no, matchless Alfreda, they will... Do me no good, for I am troubled only when I look. On what, my lord, or whom? I cannot tell. Why, let me see your eyes, my lord. Look upon me. Oh, then twill be the worse. What? If you look on me, why, then I'll be gone. <laughs> nay, nay, stay, sweet love, stay. A beauteous Elfrida, and give the Earl of Cornwall leave to speak. No, Elfrida, thy beauty hath subdued and captivated the Earl of Cornwall's heart. Briefly, I love thee. See, I ne'er so bold, so rude and rashly to prefer my suit. And if your father give but his consent, eased by that pain that troubles Ethan Wald, and this considered, Osric shall prove my father and his daughter be my love. Speak, Osric, shall I have her or no? My lord, with all my heart you've my consent, if so my daughter please to condescend. What say that, uh, but uh, what saith Alfreda? I say, my lord, that seeing my father grants, I will not gain see what his age thinks meet. I do appoint myself, my lord, at your dispose. Well, Osric, now you see your daughter's mind, but tell me then, when shall the wed be the wedding day? On Monday next. Till then, you are my guest. 
uh, awestruck when our nuptial rites are past, I must port of business uh, with the, uh, to the king. Let that be as you please, my lord, but stay not long, for I shall hardly brook your absence then. Fear not, Elfrida, I will stay, not stay there long, but come, let us in. Father, pray lead the way. Tell me, Dunstan, what thinkest thou of the favors of kings? I think of king's favors as of a marigold flower, that as, as the sun shineth, openeth her leaves, and with the least cloud, closeth again. <laughs> Even so, my lord, the favors of kings to them they favor, uh, for as their favors give life, so their frowns yield death. <sighs> well said, Dunstan. But what merits he that dissembles with his sovereign? In my opinion, my lord, he merits death. Oh, then assure thyself. If Ethanwald dissemble, he shall die. Ah, but who comes here? Perrin, what news that thou comest in such haste? And what is he that bears thee company? <laughs> It is, my gracious lord, an honest man, oh. uh, and one, it seems, that loves your majesty, for as your grace gave me in charge, I went into the country to see what sums of money I can make among the chiefest of the commonality and amongst the richest of the knights that I could find, and then they would lead your grace but not most twenty pounds. Then I came along the rest and to this plain man and asked what he could lend for this king. He answered, sir, see, but I am a poor, not half so wealthy as a knight or a squire. And yet, in sign of duty to his grace, I will lend his majesty 200 pounds. Thanks, honest fellow, for thy love to us. And if I may but pleasure thee in aught, command me uh, to the utmost, I'm, I said, England hath too few men of thy good mind. Ah. Oh. Honesty, what news? Where hast thou been so long? Uh, my lord, I have been searching for a privy knave. One, oh. my lord, that feeds upon the poor commons and makes poor peers plowmen. Wear a threadbare coat. It is the farmer, my lord, which buys up all the corn in the market and sends it away beyond seeds and thereby feeds the enemy. Alas, poor Piers Plowman, what ailest thou? Why dost thou weep? Peace, man, if any have offended thee, thou shalt be made amends unto the most. Well, I beseech your grace to fit him under stress. There is an unknown thief that robs the commonwealth and makes me and my poor wife and children beg for maintenance. All this by this unknown farmer, for, for there cannot be an acre of ground to be sold, but he will find money to buy it. Nay, my lord, he hath money to buy whole lordships, and yet but a farmer. I have kept a poor house where I dwelt this four score here, yet was I never driven to want till now. Uh, I beseech your grace, as you have still been just a secret grace for this oppression. <laughs> Alas! Poor Piers, I have heard my father say that Piers Plowman was one of the best members in a commonwealth for his table was never empty of bread, beef, and beer as a help to all distressed travelers. But where thou tellest me I harbor him and he is daily under my elbow, I assure thee, tis more than I know, for I harbor none but this, which is my honest friend. Mm. Is this your honest friend? The devil he is. My lord, this is he. Your grace, see how honest he can shake out a knave in this company. Sirrah, tell me, who hath most poor men in suit at this sizes? Well, that hath Walter would have more. He hath one poor man in suit for certain barley and another for that his horse was taken in his corn. Oh, but what indictments are against him? Read them. First, he hath conveyed corn out of the land to feed the enemy. Next, he hath turned poor Piers Plowman out of doors by his great raisin of rents. Next, he is known 
be a common disturber of men up there quiet by serving writs on them and bringing them to London to the better undoing. Also, he keeps corn in his barn and suffers his brethren and neighbors to lie in want and thereby makes a market so dear that the poor can buy no corn. Enough. Now fie upon thee, thou monster of nature, to seek the utter undoing of many to enrich thyself. Honesty, take him and use him as thou wilt. Ah. Come, sir, I think I found out your knavery. Away, sir, and bear your fellow company. Health and good hap befall your majesty. <laughs> Ethan Wald, welcome. How fares our beauteous love? Be brief, man. What, will she love or no? Then as your grace did give me, or give to me in charge, uh, I have discharged my duty every way, and to noon with the maid you so commend me. How like is there? What, I is she fair or no? Well-bodied. But her face was something black, like uh -huh. those that follow household business. Her eyes were hollow sunk in her, into her head, uh, which makes her have a cloudy countenance. She had the uh -huh. pretty tongue. Huh. I must confess, and yet, my lord, that she is nothing eloquent. Huh. Why, then, my lord, there's, there's nothing good in her. Yes, my lord. She is fit to her an earl or so, but far unfit for Edgar England's king. <laughs> so then, she is fit for Ethanwald, our Cornish Earl, but far unfit for Edgar, England's king. Uh, well, Ethanwald, I sound your policy, but tell me in faith, dost thou love the maid? Speak truly, man. Dissemble not. I do, my gracious lord, and I'll entreat your majesty to pardon me. Ethan Wald, I, I am content to pardon thee, and will be with thee myself ere long to do thee honor in thy marriage. Therefore, Ethan Wald, thou mayest depart, and, and leave us till we visit thee at home. My gracious lord, I humbly take my leave. Uh, if it please your grace, pardon me, and give me leave, I would gladly bring my nephew on the way. Oh, with all my heart, Dunstan, but stay not long. Farewell, Ethan Wald. Uh, but Perrin, yes, tell me now, what dost thou think of Alfreda? Is she so foul as Ethanwald reports her? Believe me then, she had been unfit for me. My gracious lord, Ethanwald hath dissembled with your majesty, for Alfreda is fair and virtuous, for last night, being in private conference, he had told me he had devised a mean to color with the king by forged excuse. No, no, quoth he, my Alfreda is fair, and thus my lord he fell to praising her, and from his pocket straight he drew this counterfeit, and said, "'Twas made by beauteous Alfreda." A face more fair than the sun's bright beams? Great Alexander's love, queen of Amazons, was not so fair as is fair Alfreda, uh, but Perrin, be thou secret to the king, and I will sound thee subtle practices, and, and Ethanwald, be sure I will quittance thee and teach thee how to dally with thy king. Ah, but Perrin, let's to court until to morn, and then we'll take horse and away. Ethanwald, be advised, the king hath sent to thee. Nay, more he means to come and visit thee. Why? Ay, there's the question. This to see if he can find a front whereupon to craft a pair of horns. And in plain terms, he comes to cuckold me, for he means to do it without suspect. He sends me word he means to visit me. The king is amorous, and my wife is kind, so kind, I fear, that she will quickly yield to any motion that the king shall make, especially if the motion be of love. I'll be as it is, I'll be, I'll be, for I'll be sure of this, it shall no ways prejudice to me, for I will set a screen before the fire, and so prevent an uh, what otherwise would ensue. But I question with my father first to hear how he's affected towards the king. 
What ho? Ethanwald, my son, what news? Well, I ask you, I, I'm sure you've heard the news. Not yet, I promise you, my lord. Why, then tis thus the king doth mean to come and visit you. And welcome shall his majesty be to me, that in the wane of my decreasing years vouchsafes to this honor to Earl Ostrich's house. So then you mean to entertain him well. well what else, my son? Nay, as you will, but, but here, you wife, uh, what do you think in this, that, that Edgar needs to come and be your guest? I think, my lord, he shall be welcome then, and I hope that you will entertain him so that he may know how Osric honors him, and I will be attired in cloth of bis, and all my chamber shall be richly decked with heiress hanging fetched from Alexandria. Then will I have rich counterpoints and musk, that he may say Venus is come from heaven and left the gods to marry Ethanwald. <laughs> Soon as they're both agreed to cuckold me. Uh, but here, you wife, uh, well, I am master of the bark. I mean to keep the helmster in my hand. I, my meaning is, you shall be ruled by me, in being disguised uh, till the king be gone. And thus it shall be, for I will have it so. The king hath never seen thee, I am sure, nor shall he see thee now. If I can choose, for thou shalt be attired in some base weeds, and Kate, the kitchen maid, shall put on thine. For being quickly tired as she shall be, she will serve in return to keep him company. Why, men that hear of this will make a scorn of you. And he that lies with this will make a horn for me. It is enough. It must be so. He thinks her better other ways. I think not so. Will you be gone? Father, let me alone. I'll break her of her will. Uh, we that are married to young wives, you see, must have a special care unto their honesty, for should we suffer them to have their will, they are apt, you know, to fall to any ill. Oh, but here comes the king. Earl Osric, you must needs hold us excused, though boldly thus unbid we visit you. But know the cause that moved us leave our court was to do honor to Earl Ethanwald and see his lovely bride, fair Alfreda. My gracious lord, is welcome shall you be to me, my daughter, and my son-in-law. As Titus was unto Roman senators, that in requital of his service done did offer him the imperial diadem. As they in Titus, we in your grace still find the perfect figure of princely mind. Thanks, Osric. But I think I am not welcome because I, I cannot see fair Elfrida. Osric, I will not stay, nor eat with thee, till I have seen the Earl of Cornwall's wife. If it please your majesty to stay with us, my wife shall wait as handmaid on your majesty, and in her duty show your husband's love, and in good time, my lord, see where she comes. <laughs> Alfreda. You must leave your kitchen tricks and use no words of princely majesty. Now, Jesus, bless your honorable grace. Come, I pray, sit down. You are welcome by my troth, as God save me. Here's never a napkin, fie, fie. Come, I pray, eat some plums. Mm, they be sugar. Mm, here's good drink by lady. Do you not eat? Nay, pray, pray thee, eat, Alfreda. It is enough for me to see thee eat. Ah, thank you heartily. By my troth, here's never a cushion. By my troth, I'll knock you a non go to. My lord, this is not Alfreda. This is the kitchen maid. Peace, Perrin. I have found their subtlety. Ethanwald, I pray thee, uh, let me see thy kitchen maid methinks it is a pretty homely wench i i promise thee ethanwald i will like her well my lord she is a homely kitchen maid and one whose bringing up hath been but rude and far unfit for edgar's company if your grace want merry company i will send for ladies wise and courteous to be associates with your majesty ethanwald no i will have the kitchen maid Therefore, if you love me, send for her, for till she come, I cannot be content. 
Father, I will not fetch her to soon see where she comes. Successful fortune and his heart's content daily attend the person of the king. Ugh. And Edgar, know that I am Alfreda, daughter to Osric, and lately made the Earl of Cornwall's wife. Why, uh, is not this Alfreda? No, my good lord, it is the kitchen maid whom Ethanwald, in too much love to me, hath thus attired to dally with the king. By my mm. troth, my lord, she lies. Go to, I'll course you by and by. Away, base strumpet, get thee from my sight. Go your ways. You are a pagan knave, I warrant you. <laughs> Base, Ethan Wald, dissembler that thou art, so to dissemble with thy sovereign? And afterward, under a show of love, thou camest to soothe thy lessing to the king? Meaning by that, to make me to conceive that thy intent was just and honorable. But see, at last thou hast deceived thyself, and Edgar hath found out thy subtlety. Go to thy husband, beauteous Alfreda, for Edgar can subdue effects in love. Thanks. Gracious king, mirror of courtesy, whose virtuous mm. thoughts beray thy princely mind and makes thee famous amongst thy enemies. For what is he that hears of Edgar's name and will not yield him praise as he deserves? Nor hath your grace ever been praised more or termed more just in any action than you shall be in conjuring your desires and yielding pardon to Earl Ethanwald. You will no doubt forgive my nephew's guilt. Uh, who by the merry jest he showed your grace uh, did save your honor and your chastity. We take it so, and for amends, Ethanwald, uh, give me thy hand, and we are friends, and love thy wife and live together long, for Edgar hath forgot all former wrong. Thanks, gracious king, and here upon my knee I rest to be disposed as you please. Will you be gone? My gracious lord, I humbly take my leave. Who comes here? Why, I think I have taken in hand an endless task to smell a knave. Tis more than a dog can do. I have disguised myself of purpose to find a couple of knaves which are yet behind. The next knave is a priest called John the Precise that counterfeit holiness blinds the people's eyes. This is one of them that will say, it is a shame for men to blaspheme and swear God's holy name, yet if make a good sermon and but mm, once a year, will a 40 times be in a tavern making good cheer. Yet the church will read with such sobriety that you would think him very precise and of great honesty. What honesty? Hast thou dispatched and found these privy knaves? I shall do anon. I have them in scent, but I will be gone. I have been this morning with a friend of mine that would borrow a small sum of money of me. Sir, I am a poor man and I will give 30 shillings a year. If I may have it, you shall be sure of your money. Truly, brother in Christ, I cannot afford it at the price. I must let my house to live. I ask no gains. But who comes here? I beseech you, uh, good master, for God's sake, uh, give one penny to the poor, lame and blind. A uh, good master, give something. Oh, fie upon the lazy fellow. Art thou not ashamed to beg? Read the blessing saying of St. Paul, which is, Thou shalt get thy living by the sweat of thy brows, and he that hath, will not labor is not worthy to eat. Aye, but he remembers not where Christ saith, He that giveth a cup of cold water in my name shall be blessed. Uh, alas, sir, you see that I am old. That is no reason you should beg. Alas, sir, age coming on me and my sight being gone. I hope, sir, you will pardon me, though I beg, and therefore, for God's sake, one penny, good master. I tell thee no, 
for spirit doth not move me, sir, sir, thereunto. And in good time, looked in the blessed proverb of Solomon, oh, it is, good deeds do not justify a man, therefore I count it sin to give thee anything. I see how he can wind and turn the scripture to his own use, but he remembers not where Christ saith, he that giveth to the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and he shall be repaid sevenfold. But the priest forgets that, or leastwise he will not remember it. God's oh, blessing on your heart, sir. You made a godly exhortation on Sunday. I, brother, the spirit did move me thereunto. Fie upon usury, when a man will cut his brother's throat for a little lucre. Fie upon it. Fie! We are born to er, one to live by another, and for a man to let his own as he may live. It's allowed by the word of God, uh, but for usury and oppression, fie on it. It is ungodly. But tell me, will you have it? I give you as I have proffered you. Truly, I cannot afford it. I would, I could, but I must get our, to our exercise of prayer. And after, I must go see a farm that I should have. <laughs> oh, monstrous! Dunstan, didst thou ever hear the like? Now, now fie upon the base villain. Lay hands on him. Now, honesty, hast thou done? Is here all? Oh, no, my lord, for there are so many behind that I am afraid my work will never have an end. But I see by the priest's look that he lacks company. Stay a while, my lord. I'll fetch another presently. Fie, graceless man, hast thou no fear of God to withhold thee from these lawless motions? Why, thou shouldst be as a messenger of God and hate deceit and wicked avarice, but thou art one of those whom God doth hate, that for to gain thyself a private gain would seek the undoing of commonwealth. Rise! Though it be long, I have found him at last. But I could not bring him with me. And therefore, I pinned a paper on his shoulder, meaning thereby to mark him for the gallows. But hushed, here he comes. Wh what? Perrin? I cannot think that Perrin will be false to me. Why, no, for he is false to himself. Look in his pocket and see. This is but a false writ that he hath used unknown to your majesty and levied great sums of money and bribed upon your poor commonwealth extremely. How say you, my lord? Is it true or no? Honesty, thou sayest true. Why, impious wretch, ingrateful wretch that thou art to injure him that always held thee dear. Believe me, Dunstan, I durst well have sworn that Perrin had not hatched so base a thought. Aye, but your grace sees you are deceived. But will your grace grant me one boon? What's that, honesty? That I may have the punishing of them, whom I have labored so hard to find. Oh, with all my heart, honesty, use them as thou wilt. I thank your grace. Go fetch the other two. Now, to you, cut bird, cut purse, the cunny catcher. Thy judgment is to stand at the market cross and have thy cursed tongue pinned to thy breast <coughs> and there to stand for men to wonder at till owls and night ravens peck out thy cursed eyes. Oh, good honesty, be more merciful. You know my mind, oh! Walter that would have more, and you shall have judgment, I mean, which is to be carried into a cornfield and there have your legs and hands cut off because you loved corn so well. <sighs> there rest till the crows pick out thine eyes. But now to you, that will do nothing except the spirit move you thereunto, you shall, for abusing the blessed word of God and mocking the divine order of ministry, whereby you have led the ignorant unto errors, you, I say, as you were shameless 
in your shameful dealing shall to your shame, the utter shame of it all, bad-minded men that live as thou hast done, stand in Finsbury Fields near London, and there, as a dissembling hypocrite, be shot to death. Honesty, be more favorable than so. Truly, no. The spirit doth not move me thereunto. Oh, but who is next? What? Heron, a courtier and a cousin or two, I have judgment yet in store for thee, and for because I will use thee favorably, if faith, thy judgment is but to be hanged. Now what all men living like these in this land might be judged so at Honesty's hand? Well, Honesty, come, follow us to court where thou shall be rewarded for thy pain. Hmm, I thank your grace. You that will damn yourselves for lucre's sake and make no conscience to deceive the poor. You that be enemies of the commonwealth to send corn over to enrich the enemy, and you that do abuse the word of God, and you that counterfeit the king's privy seals and thereby rob the willing-minded commonality, I warn you, all that use such subtle villainy, beware lest you, like these, be found by honesty.